September 26th of 1996 was the day that the Nintendo 64 would release in North America. Three days later, one of the most legendary platformers that many of us have come to know and love would be released, Super Mario 64. Yo, listen up. We will not live in a two-dimensional world. We won't go in one direction or see where we can set. We will walk through walls. We will take a look around us. We will not be confined. We believe in the this game would amaze nearly everyone who played it by dropping Mario into an entire new dimension of fun. You can imagine that transitioning from 2D to 3D was probably a tough job, and you'd be right. Obviously, this wasn't the first version of the game. There were older, more unfinished, and more uncanny versions. By the way, I'm also looking for an editor, or two, for my other channel, so if you are one and want to help me with videos, please do everything listed on screen and thank you in advance. B3313 is a Super Mario 64 ROM hack that has been requested multiple times since I released my last Super Mario 64 video. If you requested it, this one is for you. But, back to the game. Earlier, I referenced the beta of Super Mario 64. This game was, of course, much less polished than the current version that most of us have seen. It just seemed... emptier. Everything just feels so liminal. Let me clarify what I mean. Liminal spaces are places that seem strangely familiar to us even though they aren't. They always have a weird nostalgic feeling to them that just feels... off. This is... this is luminous spaces. What is that thing called? Where it's like there's a very creepy hallway? That's literally what this is. This is a luminous space. Put that on the Twitter account. That weird nostalgic feeling is why liminal spaces have garnered such a reputation. Like the nostalgic moments I talked about in my last video, which you should definitely watch, something about the familiarity of the past just hits you harder than something new. Maybe it's because nostalgia is typically supposed to be a comforting feeling, so when that sensation is associated with something much darker, it feels worse. Nostalgia is also something that's personal to everyone. When you feel individual and alone in an experience, it can be even more off-putting because you're isolated. I swear I've been through that door I just went through like 10 times and now it's brought me to like a whole new level. Imagine if you encountered a really creepy area in a game that terrified you, yet when you brought it up to your friends who played that same game, they had no idea what you were talking about. That would be horrifying. You'd probably feel a deep sense of doubt and dread, right? Questioning not only yourself, but your game and even your friends. Maybe they're in on it or something. It just makes you feel so... alone. Loneliness is something that a lot of people point to when they talk about why Super Mario 64 creeps them out. It's also something that people point to when they talk about how creepy liminal spaces are. Something about being completely alone is extremely off-putting to the majority of people. Perhaps it's a primal fear, because if you were alone, there was a higher chance that you wouldn't survive. It's hard to really say why being alone creeps most people out so much, though. This loneliness factor is also extremely present in B3313. This game takes loneliness to an entirely new level. Take Dark Downtown, for example. Even though this place has regular music and all kinds of plants, enemies, and even buildings, it feels very alone. You feel completely trapped as well, perhaps because of how dark and empty the whole place is. It's like walking down a dark road at night. Sure, you can still hear the bugs, see the trees and streetlights, and it's completely open, but there's a sense of being closed in there. You have that strange urge to keep moving forward so that you can get out of there as quickly as possible. This area has the same type of feeling that I just described, at least in my opinion. It's basically Wet Dry World's underground city on steroids. We all know how much people are creeped out by that place. Another example of an aspect of the game more than a specific area is the lack of render distance. Some places in this game purposefully have a way more shortened render distance, something that I pointed out really enhanced the unnerving nature of SM64.Z64. This shortened distance causes the player to feel more closed in and trapped. 
But not only that, it also increases the uncertainty of the player leading to them being further unnerved. After all, if you literally can't see what's coming, you're probably going to be a little bit more unsettled. And speaking of being alone, maybe I should talk a bit more about the personalized aspects of this game. While playing this game, you decide to head to Tiny Huge Island. It's been cool to see how this game creates beta versions of all of these places that you're familiar with, and this just happens to be one that you've been curious about seeing since the beginning. Right after starting the level, you misplay while trying to jump on the Lakitu and accidentally go off of the side. Oh well, things like this happen. No big deal, right? At first when loading back into the castle grounds, everything seems fine. But as you walk around, you realize that the sky is different. Not only that, but other things are wrong too. There's a door in the water, and none of the typical loading zones work at all. Is this a glitch? Something that's only happened to you? This would be an extremely creepy experience to have. The reality that something isn't the same as it used to be starting to set in as you walk around a place that you've been through many times before must be uniquely terrifying. This isn't the only personalized aspect of the game either. There are four different beta castle lobbies. Beta lobbies A, B, C, and D. Beta Lobby A is accessed by simply walking into the castle. Going into the upstairs door will lead you into a hallway with a Bowser painting. Unlike in the vanilla game where falling through the trapdoor in front of the painting would lead you to Bowser's Dark World, falling through it here leads into Beta Lobby B. Although it looks the exact same as A, the properties behind each door are completely different. This is the only way you would know that you were dropped into a different lobby area. Going through the basement door takes you to the Plexal Lobby, another lobby area that is much more unnerving than the previous two beta lobbies. The render distance has been cut, and instead of black like in SM64.Z64, there's this reddish fog that fills the area. There are also ghosts and such in here, making it seem like a room for the dead. Going through the upstairs door leads to an even bigger room that dwarfs Mario and looks even more uncanny. Going through a number 3 door in this room takes you to beta lobby D. In this lobby, the door numbers are different, and even though some paintings seem familiar, they take you to completely different levels. There's also a door with no number, and that door reveals Beta Lobby C. Although it looks similar to the previous lobbies, the doors are also differently numbered. Every single room is accessible through means that make it hard for the player to realize at first that anything even changed. That's what's so much creepier about this style of horror. It creeps up on you. After all of that talk about subtle horror, it's probably about time that I talk about the blatantly creepy parts of this game. If you walk around the castle grounds, you'll notice Yoshi standing beside a brick building with a dark tunnel's opening in it. When talking to him, he at first just explained some basic game stuff before saying, Oh, and don't enter this cave unless you want to see your deepest fears unfold. If you're likely a little taken aback by the sudden tone shift, yet now much more curious because of what Yoshi said, you'll probably walk in. If you walk in, you'll see a star in the far distance. After running down the long hallway, you'll finally be close and then... you'll be in the void. If you follow a small shape of light, you'll find a sign which says, Good to see you again, old friend. I see you're escaping reality again, trying to find gold inside bricks. Are you feeling okay? You know you can always turn off this game, but both of us know that you're still trapped inside your own walls, aren't you? With only a pit in front of you, you'll jump. Doing so just warps you into the castle grounds. Now that you're back here, run around the back of the castle and go in the double doors. Through a series of a bunch of steps that I'm showing on screen, you'll enter this hallway that has a pretty unnerving soundtrack and a bunch of jail cells on the sides. Through further steps, you'll go through a distorted area before reaching one of the creepiest areas in the game, a dark hallway with Bowser's face all over the walls. Once you reach the end, you'll see a faceless peach and before you can reach her, you'll be spawned into a room with a bunch of spotlights wherein you have to grab a dark star. After this, 
you'll be transported into the destroyed castle grounds, a place that's only colors are black and red with a limited render distance. All you can hear is the wind blow as all life has been sapped from this place. If you go down a pipe, you'll be transported to the haunted castle grounds, who boast a kind of similar appearance but a different soundtrack. It's presumed this place is haunted by the souls of those Mario couldn't save, at least that's what I get from it. It's extremely creepy to think about the fact that Mario may be facing a purgatory where he has to face the loss of everyone he failed to protect. If you head to the uncanny courtyard, you can find a maze. After reaching the end of the maze, you can enter a door that leads to the fun house, somewhere that reminds me of those birthday party liminal space pictures. All it has are simple colors and patterns with a black sky and no enemies at all. It's strangely nostalgic, yet empty. You'll eventually reach a room with stars on the walls, and going through one of these walls will bring you to a bob who compliments you on picking the right door, but questions whether or not you'll be able to expect what's on the other side of the door. If you choose to enter the door in the next room, you'll be faced with another door, and after going through this, you'll find a red room that has what looks like Mario standing in it. Walking up to him causes you to load into a room that's full of faceless Marios, the background music fitting perfectly in this section. This looks like the place where all of the unused and forgotten Mario assets have been pushed to, with developers forgetting to delete the room.